All attendees are in listen-only mode. I see uh, a lot of people logging in. Um, right now, Mike Wheeland and Jake Steinbrenner are here just killing some time as we let everybody log on. Good evening, everybody, those of you who can hear us. And uh, just give us a moment. We're going to wait till about 9.01 before we, uh, we uh, formally begin. If somebody from the audience wants to type a message um, so that I can see that you can hear us, that would be appreciated. Okay, so far I haven't got anybody typing yet, so can anybody can can everybody hear us? Okay, I'm not seeing any uh, Mike. I'm not seeing any uh, messages coming in. Yeah, it's under Jake. It's going to be under the questions uh, portion. Uh, I don't have that. I have so, chat open, and that's where. Yeah, I guess everyone, if we could get you to to use the chat box as opposed to the questions box, um, just test that out. It for says now. Yeah, it says type message here. If you could type, if you type in there, I, I'm assuming anyway. Okay, I just got a message that uh, that uh, people can hear us. Um, however, the attendees cannot see a chat box, so they uh, they've got to go into the questions box. And Mike, you might be the only one who can see that. I think I am. So um, I'll try to handle the questions as best I can. So how we'll do this tonight then is um, we're not going to answer any questions. Uh, until the question period at the end. So we'll go for about 20 minutes and then I'll try to sort through some of your questions um, as best I can and we'll get to okay. it uh, that way. So. All right, perfect. Okay, it's 9.03 and uh, I think we'll be ready to roll now. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jake Steinbrenner. I'm the assigner evaluator for ABOA. Um, and I want to thank you for all taking the time to come to the second session of the ABOA FIBA 6 series. Um, tonight we are featuring Michael Whelan. Um, Mike is, uh, had, had a uh, tremendous run uh, the, the past year or so, um, starting off with the World Cup Men's Championship. Um, and then following that up with the FIBA Americas in Mexico, uh, the U19s in Greece, and the Pan Ams in Toronto. So he's, he's uh, um, moving up the ladder very prominently in the eyes of FIBA. Um, just to prove that everybody loses their mind once in a while, Mike has also uh, accepted the appointment of the ABOA Vice Presidency for this year uh, to fill in until the next AGM. Uh, we appreciate him taking the time to do that in his busy schedule and I know that he will bring um, a lot of new ideas, uh, some ideas that come from the membership and we welcome that. So I'm going to hand it over to Mike and uh, like I said I unfortunately won't be able to see your questions so hold them till the end and uh, we will answer as many as we can then. Take it away, Mike. 
Thanks, Jake. I appreciate it. Um, uh, excited to be a part of the second uh, night of doing these webinars. I think uh, Karen did an excellent job last time, and anyone that was on the uh, on the webinar, I hope uh, you got some value out of it. So, in thinking of the topic that I wanted to cover tonight, um, I wanted to get involved a little bit in kind of continuing what Karen was talking about, um, in the sense of when we've made a mistake or when we have made a call or we have something crazy happen in the game, um, which happens to all of us, it doesn't matter what level, and we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about the Canada-Venezuela game from uh, the FIBA Americas semifinal. And it doesn't matter your level, but we have these situations that come up in the game where we're required to meet or we're required to handle them in an efficient, effective manner. And I don't think we've done a really great job um, dealing with the best way to go about teaching that or working with partners or maybe even pregame, the process that we need to take, the times that we need to get together and why it's um, so, so important. So that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Again, we'll have some questions at the end and uh, ask me anything, anything at all. So... First of all, what kind of situations are we talking about that we might need to, to get together? And there's many different types of situations. Not every time does something happen do we need to get a chance to get together. And when I say special situations, I mean ones that occur in the game or every other game or one every 10th game that needs um, extra attention because there's ability that a mistake could be made, it's a strange play, um, it's confusing or there's lots going on. So some types of those particular plays are multiple foul plays, unsportsmanlike foul, disqualifying foul, technical foul. Now, if we have a routine uh, two-person game at a high school in uh, Lethbridge and it's a, everyone in the gym knows it's a technical foul, do we need to meet uh, and discuss that? Is it a special, special situation? Probably not. But what we're talking about is when there are maybe multiple players involved, when there's uh, multiple officials involved, or when there might be some difficulty understanding what exactly happened. So that's, that's definitely a chance we need to get together. This next one, and we're going to find it a lot this season with the 14-second reset, um, is clock issues, malfunction, incorrect, start or stop. How many times have we been in a situation where we didn't realize the clock uh, didn't get reset or did get reset and we have no clue on the time. Now, again, does it mean all three or all two referees need to meet? No, but we need to know times that are important when to meet so that we can get it corrected. Uh, opposing calls between officials. So maybe we have a block charge uh, or a blarge as people like to refer to it, or maybe we have uh, fouls going in different directions, one an offensive, one a defensive. These are chances that we have to clear it out other than just using our verbal and our body language, we might need to actually get together. Correctable errors. Um, this is obviously a situation we don't want to get into, and I want to talk a lot or at least a little bit about prevention of a lot of these things tonight, but uh, correctable errors is certainly a chance that we have to get together. Fighting. Anytime we have any violence on the court or any fighting, uh, we need to make sure that we get together. Now, a lot of times, anytime we have to get space and, and, and get together on plays, we have to make sure that we take care of the situation on the court first and then make our plan to, to have a meeting and discuss what's going on. We're not in a rush ever to hold a meeting, to make a call. We're the ones in control. And especially when there's a lot of activity on the court, we need to make sure the benches are under control, the coaches are under control, and even in some cases, the fans are under control. Uh, shooting foul or possession. Oftentimes, we might have a difference of opinion between an official who might be waving a playoff that could be a shooting foul, and uh, they call it a possession. Does this mean we get together every time? No, absolutely not. But what it does mean is on very important plays, in crucial points of the game, this might be an opportunity that we have to get together. And, and lastly, and most importantly, and I think it doesn't matter what level you work, um, I know that I still have this happen to me, is any time that I am uncomfortable or something is very confusing on the court. And 
I kind of gauge my uncomfortableness by a color scale. So if it's a red, uncomfortable, code red, I'm, I'm stopping the situation and I'm going to talk to my partner. It might be only a second or two, but um, whatever I can do to remedy myself, even if it's a split second, uh, and make me more comfortable, the less likelihood I'll make a mistake moving forward and might help my partner when they need it. So again, why is this all important? that we handle these situations appropriately, it's got a few reasons. Number one, it's a crucial call. We wanna make sure we're getting these plays correct. And if we're not meeting and we're going on our judgment on our own, oftentimes um, we can get confused and make a mistake. Credibility. I think that a lot of times when we see referees meet, there's a fear that it looks like we're weak or we're soft or we're not strong um, because we have to talk to our partner. It's all in the approach and it's all in the way that you handle it. Um, you'll actually get more respect from, from stakeholders in the game, from the players and from the coaches and from the fans that you got together to get the play right. Now, if you do it and it takes five minutes and slows the game down, then they might think you're a little bit um, not quite prepared. But credibility is so important in our job and we need to make sure we gain that through, through meeting on these situations and control of the game. When we meet, it looks like we're taking and putting importance into the play that we're refereeing and the managing, managing the game. If we're all running like chickens with our heads cut off in all different directions, it looks like the game is in control of us. And that's something that we can't, can certainly have. All right. This gentleman in the corner, this was from uh, the Chinese Basketball Association a few years ago. If you ever want to know crazy special situations, try to tune into a game there. It happens every night and it's wild. And this is not exactly the state of mind we want to be in ever. People grabbing us, cameramen grabbing us, our partner yelling and grabbing us. Um, so what happens to us when these weird situations happen? One, we get anxious or nervous. So we have all been in that situation where we go, oh, my God, what just happened there? Either your partner called something, something happened with the players, or you called something, worst of all, and you go, what did I just do? We, um, we, we rush to judgment on our decision. So this is now when, when we've gotten together and we're already anxious or nervous, what is it that we always tend to do? We talk to our partners very quickly and we, we're in a hurry to make the decision. If we're rushed to make on our, on our decision, we're going to make mistakes. It's all about slowing things down. What happens to us in these games too, on these crazy plays, is we blank out and actually forget details of events. How often, and I think you all can agree, many times we've forgotten player numbers, we've forgotten where the ball comes in, we've forgotten what was actually happened on the play, just like um, witnesses who have been brought in by the police, oftentimes when they go get them to see a lineup or they ask for details of a crime, they forget the details because they're in such a heightened state of excitement that they forget what's important. What is also happens to us when we get in these situations, we become defensive or to the contrary, overconfident. We're doing our best to try to defend our call on the court and our partner might uh, want an explanation or want to try to assist us and it feels like they're um, attacking us. And we have to remember we're a team out here and we can't get defensive. Overconfidence is a problem too. We, want, we don't want to show we're weak by having our partner change a call or a discussion uh, move in a certain direction so we stand up for a call that maybe after we look at it after the game was incorrect. And the last is fearing a mistake. So if we've made a call already and we want to make a change, we're scared. Oh, shoot, I don't want anyone to see me make a mistake. It's no big deal. It happens to all of us. Okay, so how this is going to work tonight is in your handout section, you'll see two videos. Um, I'd like you to go into the handout section. It's on the right panel. Um, and there's going to be two clips there. I'd like you to watch both clips. There's two two clips for you to watch. The first one is a UF play is how it should be described. And the next one is VLC. So we'll give you uh, a couple of seconds to find that. If you have any problems, please send me a note. Um, but while you're doing that, I will give you a second to, to load that up and watch that on your own. And then we'll come back in uh, a minute and a half here to discuss.
So the plays we're looking at here, the first play, the UF play, is from uh, Canada, Venezuela, in a different game. This was earlier in the FIBA Americas tournament that was held <clears throat> this September. So what you're looking at um, is an unsportsmanlike foul that was called on the play. And I guess what I want you to think about when you're watching this play is, is this a situation that we need to, is this would be defined as a special situation that we need to meet and get together? So think about that yourself and then think about the call itself, if it's correct or maybe a disqualifying foul is necessary, or maybe it's just a regular foul. The second clip um, that you're going to be watching is the, the, the final seconds from the semifinal game between Canada and Venezuela. And what I want to make clear, and it's very, it, it comes to Karen's point last week and a little bit about us, is when I go to tournaments and we watch videos, we watch our mistakes. And it is the worst feeling in the world when you're in a room and they put up a video of you making a giant error. But what's so important about these videos, not only of yourselves and watching other referees, is the fact that you can learn from it. So hopefully by watching this clip today, and we'll discuss it, um, none of us will make that mistake. And certainly the gentleman who made the call in this play is a friend of mine and a great guy. And, and I think that just talking about it is not, um, we're going to bring him down. We're not going to say he, he screwed up, made the worst call in the history of the world. You can, you can have your judgment. We're not being critical of him. He would do the same if it was a video of me. And I would do the same if this was a video of Argentina, Brazil. It doesn't matter where it is or that Canada's involved, but more importantly, it's just learning. So hopefully now we've, we've had an opportunity to watch the plays. Um, so we'll get back to specifics on those plays in a moment, but what I want to talk about, and I tried to come up with a cool analogy, and I'm sorry I couldn't do it, um, but there's going to be six things we're going to do when we decide that a situation is needs extra attention and we need to meet. So number one, the first thing is call the meeting. So oftentimes we get in games, we're uncomfortable, a weird play happens like at the end of the uh, Canada-Venezuela game and we're not rushing or we're not even really thinking about getting a meeting. Every time a play happens that's kind of weird, I say to myself in self-talk, is this okay? Is this play reach the limit? Or is this over the limit and I need to speak to my partner? And I assess those. Most plays, we don't need to worry about it. But number one, call the meeting. Now, when we get into a situ situation when it's two or three officials and we've got the meeting that's begun, I want you to know that it's never good when the calling official is running the meeting. Because the calling official is the one that's already worked up. You've just given a technical foul out. Your emotions are high. And now you're the one leading the meeting. We don't want that. We want the non-calling official or the crew chief to moderate the agenda, as I put it. So they're going to run through these steps with the other officials so that we get all of the information out and we make the correct decision. Most importantly, we want to be clear of players, coaches, and fans. We don't want them involved in our conversation. It changes how we speak. It also has the impression to fans and people watching the game that they might be influencing our decision. So clear a space. We don't have to go all the way across the court. We can go somewhere that's comfortable, but clear them out. If it's a crazy situation, we need to make sure we move the players to their benches. All right, second of all, take a breath. Calm down before speaking. Too many times, and I'm just as guilty as anyone, I'll enter a meeting and I'm walking to the meeting and I'm already talking. No one's listening while we're on the move. We need to huddle and one person, again, who's moderating goes, all right, let's take a breath. Let's calm down. Perfect. When we're in a hurry, we get confused. We say the wrong thing. We forget. Uh, we're misinterpreted by our, our partners. So I want everyone to remember, just take a breath before we start, start a meeting. Next, the calling or primary official describes in detail what they have. This is a great way to start the meeting. We need to know what the person who is most heavily involved in the situation has to say. So in this case, if I have an unsportsmanlike foul followed by a technical foul, followed by a double foul, 
I would then say to my partners, I have a unsportsmanlike foul on 15 white. I have a technical foul on 25 blue. I have a double foul on the same players. Get all the information out. We don't immediately need to go to the consequences, but we need to get to the five W's, who, what, where, when, why, and how, if possible. So we want to do this in enough detail that it informs our partners with the information of what happened so they can now move to the next step, which is ask for participation and information from everyone. When we have two officials, it's very simple. There's just the two of you. But when there's three, we have a propensity to kind of leave someone out. It's usually the trail, usually someone who is down the court. We want to make sure we engage everyone else, the non-calling officials, to give as much information as possible. This also means we can use the table officials, and I've even used players if I must. I use that in the case of shooters. Hey, did you get hit? If we're desperate and we need help, just quietly go to a player and get information. But it's all about information and getting everyone involved. If you don't have information to provide, don't give opinions. Just give information. All someone would ask me, Mike, I had a technical on sportsmanlike. Did you see anything? Joe, I didn't see anything at all. Perfect. Come to a majority decision. In this case, we want to evaluate everyone's comments, figure out what happened and organize it and come to a decision. If there happens to be a case where there's an argument or a disagreement, we have to be open-minded and the crew chief in this case would uh, take the leadership to make a decision. Finally, and most importantly, divide tasks and review duties following the meeting. So. This sounds like a lot. This happens in 30 to 45 seconds for everything. But it's so important that we don't walk away the meeting not knowing what the heck happened. How many times can we all say that we've been in a situation where we've left a meeting and go, oh, shoot, we're shooting at the other end? Whoops. I need everyone to divide their tasks. If I'm the calling official, I'm going to say I'm going to report. Uh, if Joe is going to take the ball, Joe, you've got the ball on the baseline. OK, this is a Second technical foul on this coach, we need to remove them. I though then go give the information to the table first and then the coaches if necessary. And I'll talk about prevention a little bit, but a lot of these special situations in meeting is about prevention. And I think in the Canada-Venezuela game, that was a huge error that the referees ended up making is what happened in the meeting, not after, but before. So we'll get into that a little bit. So. I hope everyone got a chance uh, to, to, watch, to watch the clips. And the reason I put the first clip on there is I really wanted you to get the impression of the amount of control that all and calm that all the referees had. Um, the first play is, is a borderline disqualifying foul. It could be debatable, but it's an unsportsmanlike foul that's called on the play. I don't think a meeting is necessary, and I think you all can watch and agree that the referees are under control and they don't need to meet. Um, they're not scrambly. One referee goes and handles the bench. Another referee watches the players and the other referee who calls the foul holds his position, holds the foul, watches the players. It was beautifully handled, beautifully handled. So in that case, we don't need to meet. Everyone's pretty comfortable with the call. If one of the referees thinks that that's maybe a disqualifying foul, in the case of me, I would walk up to the official and I'd say, Joe, I understand you have an unsportsmanlike foul. Do you think we should consider a disqualifying foul? Now, I'm giving them the option because I'm not 100% certain, but it's worth the discussion. If Joe goes, no, I'm comfortable, we let Joe handle it. But if Joe has missed something completely obvious, like an undercut, and I know it's a disqualifying foul, I need to come in with information saying, I am 100% certain that this is a disqualifying foul and we can handle it accordingly. Now, in terms of the Canada-Venezuela game, I was at this game. It was very crazy and very sad for us Canadian fans. But really what happened is, and I've had a lot of questions and most of them pertain to the call, so I'll, I'll talk about it really briefly. The call itself, and I think we can all agree, um, was not a very good call. Um, and when I say that, was there contact there? Yes. Was this call maybe could have been made earlier in the game? Perhaps. But as officials, we need to know the time and score when these events 
take place. Did the referee make a huge mistake? Absolutely. Did he feel bad about his mistake? Completely. But the problem that I have and why this clip is so important is what did the partners do and what did the crew do to get the play right? Because that's truly what's most important. I'm just showing a still shot here to talk over, but one thing to remember about special situations, the end of the game is special. It's always special, especially when it's 78-78 and the stakes are high. When you meet during the game, I don't care if you talk about what restaurant you want to go to, who your favorite NHL player is during the game. But when we're late in the game and you have that timeout and that chance to meet, you go over all the details that are so important. In this case, I don't believe the referees covered everything they needed to cover. They needed to know the time. They needed to know the score. They needed to know the foul situation. They needed to know the timeout situation. They needed to know that this has to be an obvious play at a tie game to send someone to the line to win it. And I don't know if that was discussed. So let's, let's move on to now we do have a mistake made. My goodness. And if you notice the body language of the official who called it, as a very strong, quality, excellent referee, his body language was horrible. He actually put a fist up after time expired. He then waved... Uh, put a hand up, an open hand, and then waved it off. And his partner waved it off as well. So as you can see here, he's actually looking, and this is where his mistake was made, is he didn't know how much time was left. How does this mistake happen? I don't know, but it happened. And he's got his hand up. He's looking at the clock because he knows it's late. If you watch the clip again, which I encourage you to, is he now has an opportunity or at least his partner has an opportunity to come in and discuss this. And this is where it totally broke down. So as we've talked about with these situations, call the meeting. We have to get together. And if you watch the video of this, the referee spent four seconds talking. Four seconds. Now they have a monitor, which I'm not going to get into too much detail about, but we can't rely we have to rely on ourselves. We're the ones who are making the decision. Call the meeting. Get together. Clear the players. They didn't clear the players. Take a breath. Relax. They were talking. They were anxious. They were nervous. Describe in detail. If I have a partner come to me and say, I actually have a foul while I was waving the playoff dead, which the center official was, who was the crew chief, I need to take the leadership to go, partner, it's okay. Judge his body language. Judge how he's feeling. Ask him if he likes the call. Ask him if he has to have the call. And if he goes, I don't really want it. You've got options and you've got the ability to come out and go, no, the clock had expired. We're going to overtime. Because in the end, and this is what we can all take from this is players are content. Coaches are content to go to overtime. They want to see that happen. And then the last person I want to talk about is the third official who did a good job to clear players out, but in terms of the importance of this situation, they did not get involved in the meeting. They did not get involved in the video review. They did not get involved at all. And this is an NBA referee who's an excellent referee. And I asked him, I said, what did you think about that play at the end? How? And he goes, I couldn't believe it. My jaw dropped. And I said, if ever my jaw drops on the court, folks, and this goes out to all of you, go tell somebody, go talk to somebody, get your opinion involved. And, and, and assist your partners to come out with what's good for the game. And in this case, it wasn't what's good for the game. Um, whether or not you can say the foul occurred before time, you could say yes. It, is it the same as our boss in Mexico defended the referees and said, if we call this at the start, we call it at the end? No problem. But we all know what really has to be best for the game. And as a crew, we need to get together and decide that. So I've gone very fast through this and taken uh, almost most of the time. So now I'd like to take an opportunity for you folks. Uh, this is a creepy, really weird guy that I found on the internet. So if any of you have any questions, uh, please submit them and, and we'll happy to take a few minutes to answer them. Come on, people, some questions.
I just want to repeat the uh, verbiage you used at the end there, Mike. We always have options. Um, I think that's an extremely important point to get it right. It's totally true, Jake. And we have this fear that we're, everyone's watching us and we have to make this quick decision. But in the end, when we calm ourselves down and we get together as a group and know and, and talk in a manner that is in control, we can come to the decision that is for the best. And oftentimes we are in such a rush that it, it hinders our decision making. Are you getting any questions there, Mike? No, I just did such a uh, tremendous job or everyone's bored. So one or the other. If there aren't any questions, that's not a problem. Okay, for somebody who has actually been at a CIS championship where almost the identical thing occurred, other than we shot free throws at the other end of the court, um, probably a dozen years ago now. Um, this looks very eerily familiar. And uh, the same thing happened. The officials did not get together. They did not convey enough information. They did, did not um, take, the, take the position that they had options. Um, so you know, this, is a, this is certainly a reminder. If we don't have any further questions, Mike. Yes. OK, then um, I want to thank uh, everyone who attended tonight. Oh, um, I just got a text that, that somebody asked a question that didn't go through. Um, Let me just uh, take one second, folks, to um, see why the questions are not. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, okay, so first question is the debrief after the game uh, was I wasn't a part of it. Um, essentially, what's important, and, and Jake can attest to this as our evaluation, we do need to support the referees. So our boss supported the referees. However, um, the approach they took was that this was a foul and that they were okay with the foul. Now, um, behind closed doors, I'm sure that there's uh, some issues um, that probably came up, but um, they defended the referees. If time hadn't expired, why are you saying it was a bad call? This is an ex excellent question, and this is where we get into the difference of uh, philosophy versus pure refereeing. It's very difficult to say um, in a judgment position that we're in where there's rarely black and white in our calls, that it, um, it wasn't a foul. It, it certainly was a foul. There was contact there on a player. But with the ball in the air, with time about to expire, had we not made the call, would the world have noticed? Would the players have noticed? Would we have been able to move on? We need to use that feel for the game versus judgment. Absolutely. Um, some techniques to keep the right number. Wow, very good. And I'm still working on this. I think the techniques have to come from the non-calling officials and also, of course, the calling official to say, just throw that number in your head right away. You have to repeat it. It's like when you meet somebody new. If you don't say their name either out loud or say their name to themselves, oftentimes you'll forget. So I think it's important to repeat the number to yourself. Um, can the other referee change the call? This is a good question. Anytime we meet, now in this particular case, if the referee had just blown the, blown the foul before time had expired, the other referee cannot come in and wipe the call out. They have nothing that they can do. They must stay with the call. But in a situation that's late in the game and the horn could be horn, could be foul, 
you, the other official could have come in and said, listen, I'm waving it off. I know that you're not really big on this call. We don't have to go with it. It happened as time expired. We explain it to the coaches. We explain to the Venezuela coach that just as much you like this call, if we had called it against you, you wouldn't want this to happen. We're going to overtime because in the end, everyone wants overtime. A couple more questions. I'm keeping a little longer. Um, what is your approach working with an older official rather than younger official? So that's a good question. So remember crew hey, chief. who asked that? That's, hey, Mike, Mike yes. who asked that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's, I can't tell, I shouldn't, shouldn't be showing you this. Anyways, um, <laughs> it's okay. It's, I'm not asked, I'm not telling any tales out of school. They're all good questions. So younger officials and older officials, I want to make one very important thing clear. Older officials and crew chiefs, for that matter, are not always correct. And they're the ones who are often overconfident and don't want to give up their calls. So first of all, if you're a young official and you have 100% certainty, be strong with your opinion. Doesn't mean you might be able to overrule them, but at least giving them some clarity and calming the situation will be able to assist them and they might need you. We assume that the crew chief is always right and they are certainly not always right. And I think on the flip side, dealing with younger officials as an older official or a more experienced official, we have to be um, know and pick our spots when to assist the younger officials. Young officials will make mistakes and we need to make mistakes to get better. I think it's important to know the gravity of the situation and the gravity of the call in order to best come in and assist. And we want to do it in a way that doesn't hurt them or make them feel um, disvalued. Okay, I'm going to answer one more question and then let you go. Um, if the decision had had been made to not make the foul call and go to overtime, what do you suggest the coaches be spoken? What do you suggest saying to the coaches? If I had that situation and the gravity and importance of that game and I had some confusion at the end, what I would do is, number one, we need a decision. They had a decision, which was wipe the play off. They went and met because there was two counter decisions and they called a foul. If I had waived the playoff, I would waive the playoff after meeting with my partner very clearly and openly. I report to the table, the basket is no good, time expired very clearly, very much in control. And then I go to both coaches, either at the same time, most preferably, or separately, depending on the situation, and I explain to them. My partner had a foul, we believe it expired. It happened after expiration of time. We're going to overtime with possession of blue based on the arrow, and we move on. If they want to go further with a discussion on this, coach, that's it. That's our decision, and we're going to go play, play on. And I think in this case, had the referees done that and not had felt the responsibility of um, instant replay and, and various other factors, um, they would have done that. I think most of us would do that in our games in senior men, senior women's, or even high school or ACAC. So I've gone a little bit over time. I hope, uh, I hope you guys got some value uh, out of it. I'm glad I got your question. Sorry the delay. We're working on the best possible ways to, to do these events for you folks. Please send me some feedback at aboa.vicepresident at gmail.com. Tell me how I did, or good or bad, and how you like these events, and uh, we'll keep them going. You're going to have two events coming up. Uh, then Perry Stothert's going to be speaking on the 26th in this series, as well. Uh, Morgan Monroe is going to be doing an educational test refresher in leading up to our test in December. And that's going to be tentatively scheduled for the 24th. So you'll be getting updates on those. And again, thanks so much for everyone for participating and joining us tonight. And uh, have a good uh, group of games this weekend. Thanks so much. Thank you, Michael, for uh, an excellent uh, presentation um, on a very, very um, intriguing and uh, complicated uh, topic. Uh, for somebody who has made one of the most ridiculous and, and egregious mistakes at the end of a season in 1982 at an ASAA provincial 
um, that's often where these kinds of things happen. And uh, um, for about 30 years now, I think the ABOA has had to deal with many situations at ASA Provincials. Can we always pinpoint the exact things that might happen at the end of game? No. But if we know our roles and we work on communication, then I think we'll be able to resolve things to the best of our ability. So once again, Mike, excellent presentation and uh, thanks for coming everybody. Good night.